Hello and welcome to the Rugby Report Exiles preview podcast in association with Vaux Brewery. My name is Richard Spate and once again I'm stored away in my little hut on the side of a mountain in Wales, thankfully at the other end of the country from where all the flooding and disruption has been. I'm still battered by 60 mile an hour winds and driving rain and I'm joined down the line today by Jimmy Lawson in Oxford. How are you mate? Yeah, very well, thanks yourself. I'm okay, yeah, a bit cold. It's gone cold here. And uh, we've got Martin Wanless in Australia. How are you, mate? I am well, thank you. I'm just about surviving this um, 11 or 12 degree chilly start to um, to a Thursday morning. Yeah, you got the kookaburras singing in the trees? Yeah, kookaburras Absol- singing in the trees. Absolutely. Lacking, lacking any kangaroos today, but no, I am a stereotypical Australian. Just need to fire up the barbie. Fantastic. And uh, we've got Michael Dunn over the water from me in Ireland. How are you there, Mike? Oh, good, mate. Yourself? Just on yeah, the same holidays here. Yeah, yes. yeah, you're on half term. Relaxing. Yeah. Got the wet weather and the winds as well, so not too different to yourself. Yeah, you get it about half an hour before we do. Yeah. <laughs> So it was an eventful weekend uh, for the Sunderland men's and women's side. The lads recorded yet another victory away at Oxford as the promotion push continues. And the lasses took on WSL um, side Birmingham City. They took them all the way in the FA Cup, sadly losing 1-0 to an 85th minute goal from uh, former Black Cat. Lucy Staniforth, who then proceeded to get herself sent off and get someone chucked out of the ground who'd been Gordon. Got some good coverage in the national press as well. So there's a few articles that you can read about that. But on this week's show, we're going to focus on the men's team and our jam-packed agenda, as ever, is going to feature this time our reactions to our potential victory in the uh, 2014 League Cup. A look back on Jimmy's day out at the Kazam as well, uh, which is basically a whole match for you, wasn't it, Matt? It's, it's a short one. It's one of the short ones, yes. That was that was one of the redeeming things of getting absolutely drenched for two hours. But yeah, no, it's not it's not too far from me. So we'll look back at that game and we'll look ahead to this weekend's game at Bristol Rovers, including an interview with our very own West Countryman Bomber that he recorded with Max from the Gas Cast podcast. We'll have some branch shout outs and we'll finish up this week with what might prove to be the toughest round of playing away so far. So, um... Lads, what are your thoughts on the Man City situation? I mean, the, obviously they've been banned from UEFA competitions for two years pending an appeal. Uh, there's potentially a separate investigation by the Premier League, which could see them stripped of their 2014 league title. And, and logic suggests that, you know, if the Premier League and UEFA are, are examining their competitions, that the EFL might look at the EFL Cup. Would you be, how would you feel if we were handed the uh, the 2014 League Cup title in retrospect. I'm not too sure how I feel about it, to be to be perfectly honest. Although I was just thinking that I didn't really mind too much when we got promoted in 1990 because of Swindon's um, financial irregularities. So I, I think the, the whole issue with Man City is a, a pretty complex one. I, I'd be very surprised if, if they don't win their appeal with UEFA and I'd be very surprised if the Premier League actually take any action because it's an absolute can of worms that they'd be opening if, if they did. Having said that, if you know if you've got these financial fair play rules in, you've you've got to have some enforcement of them, and I think uh, a lot of clubs aren't aren't adhering to them. It, it seems at present. It was it's interesting if you look back. We were actually fined by the EFL that year for fielding an in, ineligible player. I think we fielded was it was it G who we fielded yeah. that year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was eyes. Uh, it Clear international clearance hadn't come come back through from the German club where where he was on loan. I don't think that's um it's a it's an interesting kind of a side to that that you know Premier League teams can be fined by the EFL they can be sanctioned by the EFL for breaking their rules. It'd be a strange one though. Like how how would you even like celebrate it or anything? like would you get the whole band back together from uh, 2014 <laughs> for a little celebration up in the stadium of light or like. I just think at this stage, really, if we won it, I, I don't know how I feel. I just kind of go, ah, well, we got the cup, but really we didn't. Like, you know what I mean? We just, I don't know, it'd be hard, it'd be hard one to celebrate, really, so long ago now. It, it, it would piss the mags off, though. That's quite <laughs> a, an that. appealing part of it. Still, Bardsley's penalties become important all of a sudden <laughs> in, that, in that semi-final. <laughs> it's <laughs> interesting. When you think, like... Obviously, there have been similar situations or analogous situations anyway in, in sport over the last few years in the Olympic movement with the Russian athletes being banned following the doping scandal and the, the titles handed down to the, the next athlete or the next team. And then in cycling, it, it didn't quite work the same way when Lance Armstrong was sanctioned, obviously, for doping offences as well. Um, what are your thoughts on it, Jimmy? 
I don't want us to get the first major title that we've won in our lifetime because of financial fair play. That cup run was incredible. It's definitely been some of the most fun experiences I've had supporting Sunderland. The win against Chelsea was brilliant. It's one of the best Sunderland performances I've ever seen. To then back that up with that crazy game at Old Trafford, those crazy two legs against Manchester United. It's definitely like one of the most fun experiences I've had supporting Sunderland. The final itself was great. The fact we showed up, the fact we played well, the fact that Gus Poirier, to be fair to him, pretty much got his tactics spot on. But we lost to the better team on the day and we lost that match. And I kind of feel like that's that's that done. Yeah, if, if we are to win a major trophy in my lifetime, I don't want it to be one where we won it because Man City leaked some emails that threw the UEFA under the bus. It just, yeah, it wouldn't sit right with me. I don't think it's going to happen, but it wouldn't sit right, right with me either. I think a lot of these um, sanctions for the financial mismanagement of football clubs at the minute seem to be falling pretty heavily on the fans through point deductions, through sporting bans. I mean, you do have to have sanctions on mismanagement, but it does seem reasonably mean-spirited if we took that title off Man City. I mean, 20 years ago, they were in the same position we are now. And I talked to a lot of Man City fans uh, around here who, you know, that we do have a, a kind of association with because they've been where we are now and they've got up to the dizzying heights of Global Super Club. So, yeah, I think it would, for me, feel a bit like punishing the Man City fans rather than punishing the owners. Would, would they care, do you think, though? You know, they, they won that game at Wembley. They had that day out. We, we lost it. Six years later, they're not going to care if it gets taken off them, really. It's just in the record books, isn't it? And, and like, like Jimmy said... I think if, if we were going to win the cup, if and when we win a cup, you want to be there in the moment celebrating. You don't want to be given it six years later by default. Absolutely. I can't see it happening, but there's a logic there that says that if the, the other two organisers of the competitions are, are going to be investigating, are going to be sanctioning possibly City for their irregularities, then it could happen. There's there's a chance. I'd be interested to know what, uh, what the listeners think, actually. So uh, let's move on from that. There's not that much to discuss. It's all speculation. Um, let's look back at the weekend in Oxford. So it's probably best to come to you, Jimmy. Um, you were there. It's your local game, as we were saying. Is it a ground you know pretty well, then? It's a weird one. I've been there four times this season, and that's probably as much as I've been yeah, the rest of my lifetime, really. It's just such a crap stadium. I mean, it's it's the free stands. It's the fact it's in the middle of nowhere. It's the lack of bars near the ground. It really is a bit of a dive. But because we played them in the League Cup, because when we were playing Bury, they had a big game against Wickham, and because they drew the mags in the FA Cup, I've been there four times and it's a weird one. I'm very happy to see Sunderland come out winners there for the first time in my three trips to see Oxford play Sunderland. But it's such a naff match day experience. It's not one I try and make a habit of going to. Do you have many mates who are used fans? Nah, no. Nah, I grew up 10 miles outside of Oxford. So it's pretty much as close to me as Wickham. And I think people I knew in school who wanted to support local team gravitated to Wickham and because the the atmosphere is better. So I don't really know anyone who gives a damn about Oxford, to be honest. It didn't look like Charlie Methven give that much of a damn about Oxford. He was in the away end as well uh, on Saturday. I did not know that. Yeah, very, very interesting that he's he's still hanging about. Yeah, from I mean, from all accounts, I've been a critic of his, but from all accounts, he was uh, supporting the lads pretty vociferously. And uh, I think there was a photograph pretty captionable photograph taken after the, the match with uh, Kevin Phillips as well. Well, even, even though he's resigned from his day-to-day position, he still owns a, a stake of the club, doesn't he? So no doubt he's still um, invested to, to some extent. What are your thoughts on, on the game, Mike? How did you follow it? It's one of those games again where we're, we're, we're showing that we're winning matches in different ways, isn't it? Like over the last week, I mean, we kind of had that uh, tough first half against Ipswich and got the late goal. Maguire's goal, 10 minutes to go. Then obviously we blitzed Rochdale the first half an hour to go 3-0 up. And then we kind of grafted, got the early goal against Oxford and like had a defensive battle for the last 85 minutes, you know, shut up shop. So it's interesting to see that we're kind of winning games in different ways in comparison to last year where like really you would think that was going to be a one-all draw. Um, that's our sixth clean sheet in seven games. So 
it's nice to see us winning in different ways, but I suppose the only negative to come out of it was uh, Bailey Wright's injury, wasn't it? It was. I mean, he's, he's what played five games for us. I, I saw him at Tranmere. I think it was his debut, and he looked he looked solid there. He had a little bit of a wobble, but then last couple of games he's been an absolute absolute rock, and it it, it was sad to see him go off and sad to see he's out for the season. It brings us, I guess, is the the main talking point really. Now he is out for the season. We've got. Two other centre backs, regular centre backs uh, that have played uh, this season, Joel Lynch and Ali Moz Turk. Martin, what, where would you go if you were in Parky's shoes? Would you stick with Moz Turk? Or Lynch is now back available, I presume. It's got to be Ali, surely. I think if Wright hadn't come in, Oz Turk would still be inside playing in that central role of, of the back three. And he didn't do a great deal wrong to warrant getting dropped, I didn't think. I think. It was one of those situations where Bailey Wright is evidently a more solid player than Oz Turk is. But if you look at Oz Turk throughout the Sunderland career, you know he had, he had a poor start last season, especially um, I think it was the game against Sheffield Wednesday in the League Cup where he got turned inside out, and he, you know he was blatantly unfit and a little bit heavier than he should be. But every time he's come back into the side, I think he's done himself justice, and I think he's been harshly treated on occasions. I think he's been harshly treated. At the start of this season, when Jack Ross, even though he's playing a back three, opted for Jordan Willis in the centre and Conor McLaughlin and Tom Flanagan either side, rather than bring Oz Turk in as, as one of those three. And I think he was harshly treated by Parkinson, although understandably so. So I think you bring Oz Turk back in, he's a perfect player, I think, to, to play in, in the centre of those three and let Lynch and Flanagan fight it out for the left-hand side slot and hopefully Willis keeps himself fit for the remainder of the season. What are your thoughts on that, Jimmy, on the on the centre-back situation? Do you agree with Martin there? That, uh, yeah, it's pretty, yeah. pretty obvious. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's wholly obvious. I fully expect Parkinson, mainly, um, yeah, like Martin's last point mentioned, for continuity's sake, Willis has made that position on the right-hand side his own. His pace means that out of all our defenders, he's the one best suited to covering those distances, getting out wide. And he's also shown an ability to enter attacks and support O'Neill and Maguire from that area. So I don't see any reason why you'd want to change that or mess with that when it's worked so well. I think also, yeah, Flanagan's playing quite well on the left-hand side of the defence as well. So if Lynch does come back in, that's the position he's been playing before. That's where he should be targeting his opportunity to come back into the team being our only left-footed centre-back. So for continuity's sake, it makes sense to bring Oz Turk in. I think Oz Turk's form this season has been a little bit overrated, but considering the amount of clean sheets we've kept recently, I really don't see the argument for Lynch starting in that central spot ahead of him or rejigging the back three to make room for Lynch. I think Oz Turk's a no-brainer. Mike, what's your thoughts on the centre-back situation? I mean, from from my perspective, I think I would go with Ozturk. My only fear is he, he he's a walking card, I often think, and there's, there's a couple of uh, weird handball situations in, in a couple of the games he's played recently. I, I thought he kind of got away with somewhat. What, what do you think, Mike? There seems to be a lack of trust, first with Jack Ross and then with Parkinson. In Ozturk, he always seems to be made a scapegoat. You know, if there's going to be changes made, uh, he seems to be the first lad taken out but I think it's it's an obvious choice Osterk's straight swap in for Bailey Wright and I, I would trust him going forward to put in some solid displays but I can, I, I'd be fairly fairly shocked if Joe Lynch comes in ahead of him What do you think of the other um, if there are going to be any changes and Parky hasn't been changing anything do you think there are any potential changes out there lads for Saturday I mean Gav gave Charlie White a 3 out of 10 in the Rogue Report ratings at the weekend which uh well, compared to everyone else, was a was a was a low mark. Do you think it is time for Lafferty to come in? I think it's got to be, hasn't it? I think um, why? I think Gav's rating. I think obviously Jimmy's um, be on the receiving end of some ratings flack over the time as well. But I think a three was probably a little bit harsh given Wyke's, um defensive performance. I think he, he helped the team out a lot and helped get that clean sheet. But going forward at the other end, that's where his main job is. He's he's not a goal threat. And quite simply, when we're playing with one out and out forward, albeit supported by Maguire and, and Gooch, we've got to have a significantly more more of a goal threat than, than White gives us. And I think, especially with Wright um, coming out the side in, in defence, we might need to score more than one goal on occasion to, to win games. We can't rely on, on clean sheets. And I think Lafferty's got to be given a shot. Having said that, 
you know, Parkinson seems to really rate Wyke and, and really rate his um, his place and role in the side. So it'll be interesting to see what he does. But I think if, if given that we brought Lafferty in, given that he's been brought in with the intention of him scoring a few goals to help us achieve what we want to achieve, he's got to be given a chance because Wyke isn't doing it. He's not going to start though, is he? Like realistically? Like he's not I'd be surprised. Any changes. Yeah, I, I think I think really the only change will be Oster in for Wyke. I'd be shocked to see if Lafferty starts because obviously Parkinson seems seems to see something in White that maybe a lot of fans aren't seeing at the moment. But I was saying last week in the podcast at the Ipswich game, I was just it was so frustrating watching White for a lad with such a physical presence. He really doesn't use his body enough. He doesn't win enough headers. He, he constantly looking for that easy free fall into the ground before the ball even gets to him from long kicks up the pitch. But I think I would personally have Lafferty in, but I don't see it happening. And I was just saying as well, I'm very interested, it's intrigued to see when Declan John's going to get a chance. He hasn't even been on the bench since he's arrived. But obviously I wouldn't have put him in ahead of Hume, but the likes of him and Scowan, I'd be really intrigued to see when they're going to get a chance. Um, I know Scowan came on for Gooch midway through the second half last week and apparently by all accounts he was quite good. I don't know, Jimmy, you probably saw more than I did. Yeah, I thought he was okay. I thought, yeah, he was all right. It was quite a tricky situation that he's been thrown into. It's also quite interesting that his two starts have come sort of in an advanced role when sort of my impression was that he's he's a pure central midfielder that so far we haven't seen him in place of Dobson and Power. We've seen him playing with the two of them. Um, but yeah, no, he's he's a sign that I was keen to see more of. But I think you guys nailed it. Realistically, White probably does deserve a break to be taken out of the firing line. His performances seem to be trending downwards but I can't see Parkinson changing it especially when you consider how good we were in our last home game against Rochdale Bristol are probably slightly better than Rochdale but they're still not that good a team at this level so I'd be very surprised if he doesn't start like the only other thing I'd sort of add I think you guys did a great job of summarizing it is that I'm waiting to be blown away by Carl Laffey I'm waiting to be seriously impressed by him I mean He's got very limited minutes so far. Um, Portsmouth was where he got his longest run out, and I thought he was really poor in that game. But I'm still waiting to see more from him. I'm not sure he's done enough in the minutes he's got here and there to really say to Parkinson, I have to be playing. You, you need me in this team. And I wonder whether that's that's another reason why we haven't seen more of him. I do think it is mainly that Parkinson's a conservative coach and he doesn't want to change a winning team but I think that's also maybe another factor that doesn't get brought up enough that Lafferty hasn't quite hit the ground running here Well I think it's time we hear from uh, the boys from the West Country we've got our very own Bomber with his uh, preview interview with Bristol Rovers fan Max from the Gascast podcast Hello all, Bomber here with your Royal Club Report Extra podcast and it's a Wurzel special for you this week as I go farmer to farmer to preview Saturday's fixture against Bristol Rovers with fellow West Country right? Max from Gascast. Max, good evening, how are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Good, yeah, that's a pleasure to have you. So we'll kind of jump straight into it because I think it's fair to say that 2020 has not been kind to Bristol Rovers so far and if my research serves me rightly, your win on Saturday over Blackpool was your first since before Christmas, is that right? Yeah, Saturday marked uh, what was the end of a winless run of 14 games in all competitions, which was a bit of a relief to say the least that we got to the end of that run and got three points against Blackpool. But it's uh, it's certainly been testing times for gas heads. And when you factor in the weather and the time of year, attendances understandably haven't been the best. So it's been a bit of a tough start to the year, but I think things are slowly starting to improve, I hope. Yeah, that game against Blackpool, what kind of happened to that? Were you one nil down and then brought it back or...? We did, yeah. So we went one nil down within two minutes um, and it was sort of the feeling of here we go again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'd had a few games before, Tranmere away, Bolton away, Wickham away, where we'd had the lion's share of quality chances but not come away with the win. Blackpool was a game where it was very much almost a coin toss with the weather and the, the high wind and the rain. There was not a lot of quality football. The ball was in the air a lot, a lot of, the, of the match. And um, I think it was just, it, it was a bit of luck really that things went our way. Their player slipped over and two-footed our striker and got sent off. And then, <laughs> and then our centre-back decides to shoot from 35 yards and the wind carries it into the top corner. So it was just one of those games where we needed a bit of luck because we've been unlucky in previous games. And thankfully, we did get the rub of the green and came away with the three points, which we probably deserved a couple yeah. of weeks ago, to be honest. 
I guess I guess in the the current state of affairs with yourselves, you'll you'll take a a fortunate two one victory and uh, and a, a perhaps a lucky sending off and a and a couple of lucky goals. You'll take it however you can get it at the moment. Absolutely, and and luck does seem to balance itself out. I mean, we got very very unlucky at Tranmere, mm. two off the line, hit the crossbar twice. You know, it's just sometimes when you luck's out, you luck's out. But then yeah. the next week it can all go for you. So. I tend to think that these things do balance themselves out over the season and it's just that all the bad luck seems to have come for the new manager and all the good luck was with the old manager. So it's yeah, it's well, frustrating. That's, that's something I was going to touch on because I have to say it was a shock to me seeing the run of form that you've had lately because before Christmas I can certainly considered Bristol Rovers as, as maybe a bit of a dark horse as a promotion rival. Obviously earlier in the season you had wins against Oxford, Rotherham, Ipswich and you've taken points off of Portsmouth, Wickham and Peterborough as well. So all those teams are in and around that, that playoff hunt but since kind of Christmas time it all seems to have gone very wrong for you or the season's kind of turned on its head so for those who are, who are listening perhaps don't look at the rest of the league so closely and, and aren't au fait with what's going on at, at Bristol Rovers or what has been going on what's changed for you or what did change for you over that Christmas period that has turned your season upside down well after that uh, fantastic win at Ipswich we were fourth in the league um, our highest position in I think over a decade in the football pyramid. Mm. Our manager, Graham Coughlin, came out post-match and instead of saying what a fantastic result it was and how far we can go this season, he practically resigned on the spot. He said that he was um, considering his future and he'd be leaving. Surely enough, the next day he announced that he was moving to uh, Mansfield Town in League Two. Wait, he Uh, said that in his his post-match? In his post-match, he came out and he said, I'm considering my future. I don't know if I can take this club any further. I've got a lot to think about with my family being living up north he's got quite a young family hmm. and then sort of the players were a bit bemused by it because they that was the first they'd heard of it as well so the whole atmosphere from being on cloud nine after what was a fantastic away win at Ipswich probably our best away win of the decade in terms of the size of the club it was just went from from cloud nine all the way to rock bottom really and yeah he left the next day signed for Mansfield Town as their manager the primary factor for him was that he wanted to move back to Sheffield to be closer to his young family. Yeah, I, I think it's it was a real shock to go from fourth in League One down to, I think it, they were 18th in League Two. Mm. Um, but, you know, you can't really blame him if that was the reason. He's got a young family. I think he was only seeing them once a fortnight. He moved down to Bristol on his own and was only seeing them uh, once every other week. Um, yeah. He said that he was living in this, renting a flat and having microwave meals every night. I think it was just getting to him quite a lot that he couldn't see his family. Um, mm. And it was understandable uh, and he couldn't really turn down the offer from Mansfield, given his situation. Mm. And uh, maybe he figured he was overachieving and that the club were overachieving. If he looked at our fixture list coming up, I think maybe he saw that we had some tough games ahead. Uh, maybe he realised his stock was never going to be higher than it was. And that Mansfield came in with a good offer. He couldn't really say no to it, given the location of it, maybe. But yeah, in any case, um, we sort of had to <laughs> make a change through no choice of our own. Make a decision, really. We had eight first team injuries at the time. We had an FA Cup and leasing.com trophy run that was sort of intertwined in that Christmas schedule. So we had something like eight games in 21 days with eight first team players out. So, I mean, he couldn't have picked a better time to leave, really. And it was always going to be difficult for any manager coming in. So Garner did come in. Ben Garner came in about a week later. Had to hit the ground running, given the injuries and, and, and the run of games that he had. And I thought it was a very difficult job. Results mm-hmm. weren't great, obviously. Um, no wins. And I think from there, we really sort of struggled to pick ourselves up in January and get going again. Things aren't working out too well currently. And you, obviously that change of manager, uh, the injuries and the, the kind of upcoming fixtures kind of put paid to your, your Christmas and New Year period. But what did fans make of that new appointment at the time? Because on the face of it, it does, well, for me anyway, as an outsider looking in, seem a very odd appointment having a quick look at his background he didn't really look to have done anything of note I think he was in India the last time he was doing anything in the game and when as I understand Ian Holloway was calling to say that he would be interested in coming back to the club like I say it does seem like a very odd appointment so what was the fans reaction to that? Yeah it was a mixed reaction to be honest as an appointment I think Ben Garner's pretty much a polar opposite to Graham Coughlin where Coffin was very sort of old school, played defensive and on the counter attack. Garner's a very modern coach. Um, he's a young guy. He likes to play high possession and attacking football. Where Coughlin sort of plays narrow and sits deep. Garner likes to push up and he likes his players to close down and press from the front. And where Coughlin sort of had a long career in the game and was in a lot of dressing rooms and knows how to get the best out of individuals. Garner had to retire at a young age due to injury. 
um, was coaching under 12 football since he retired and has sort of worked his way up the coaching pyramid. They're very different characters. They're pretty much chalk and cheese. So it was a very big surprise given we were fourth in the league. I think a lot of fans would have liked an internal appointment just to sort of continue the work that Coughlin was doing and keep yeah. things consistent. I myself never really saw Coughlin's style as sustainable. I think we were overachieving and we were getting very lucky in a lot of games. Our goalkeeper, Ansi Yakola, was probably making about four or five top class saves every game. Mm-hmm. The goals we scored were pretty much half chances and they were all we would create for the whole game. I think we would have dropped off, if I'm honest. So I was a fan of the appointment. I think we did need to change the way we played, but I think transforming the squad is a monumental task because Coughlin had a setup to play one way and one way only and there was not a lot of flexibility to change shape or personnel we were so robust in the players he brought in uh, to play this one system yeah I think it was a question of appointment given we were fourth in the league it was a good opportunity to go up and the board seemed to have said they seemed to think that maybe we wouldn't have gone up and we needed to just bring someone in to bring in a more sustainable um brand of football that can long term get results because you can't just rely on half chances and staying solid and getting lucky because it's just it was never gonna over the course of the season I think get us in the playoffs yeah well it's like it's like you said that luck balances itself out over the course of the season so if you were riding or if you were considering that you were riding your luck during that period you know that's going to come to a halt at some point if I'm reading into that correctly then generally the fans felt that it was going to come to a head sooner or later irrespective of who was in charge I think a lot of people have realized that yeah I mean it was evident that None of our wins were particularly convincing. Um, Mm -hmm. They were by one goal and we were probably under the cosh for large periods of the game. Um, I I don't really think bringing someone in like Holloway would have been... Yeah, it may have been a good choice short term, but I think long term, this this, this appointment is a long term vision. Um, And you can say maybe the timing of it wasn't great given we were so high in the league and it's an opportunity to get promoted. Maybe a lot of I think a lot of fans are a little bit resentful that we didn't bring in Holloway and say, okay, just get us up this year, mm. get us in the playoffs. Let's have a roll of the dice in the playoffs and see if we go up. And then in the summer, get someone else in if you need to. I don't know. Ben Garner was available. He looked an exciting prospect from the board's point of view, and they got him in. So he's in now, and people are behind behind the idea of it, I guess. Okay. So I guess it, from, it, from your point of view, then Garner is kind of in victim of circumstance because on the face of it, just for me, not as a Bristol Rovers fan looking at it quite objectively I see these very very good results then a change of manager and then an absolutely drastic set of results to follow that so it, it, by the sounds of it it's not as simple as the change of manager has completely screwed up your season and I think from from a Sunderland fan and from Sunderland's point of view with Parkinson um, you know he came, he's come in halfway through a season where he wasn't the most popular choice and people were saying even Ian, Ian Holloway had thrown his hat into the ring and we were saying that we We should get someone in who will guarantee us to get promotion and then we'll look at it again in the championship. And I think Parkinson, by and large, was was very much an underwhelming appointment for us. But I think there's a lot of humble pie being eaten nowadays. So, yeah, I think we can can relate. When I was looking through some of the stuff in terms of your fixtures, your results that have gone on uh, before Christmas, that, that run that you had, the one thing that stands out to me is the amount of goals that you scored in that period. So I know you said there's a few kind of scrappy 1-0 wins and a couple of lucky goals, but in that five games up until a 0-0 with Peterborough just before Christmas, you'd scored 14 goals in just those five games. That followed a 0-0 at Peterborough, which in itself is a good result. And then all of a sudden Christmas happens, the change of manager happens, and you find yourself only scoring four in your next 10 games. You've obviously got Clark Harris who I think, and I, I know a lot of the local report guys think, is one of the best strikers in the league. Um, I think there's a few people who would have liked to have seen him perhaps take a move and wouldn't have objected to him coming to the stadium alight in January. Is it as simple as, as him and his form dropping off after Copeland's departure? Or is a new manager using him differently? Or is there something else to account for his for the sudden lack of goals in the team? Yeah, I think Johnson's been playing well. I think before, under Coughlin... He was doing so much on his own and he was having to sort of work hard to buy himself space and create chances for himself. And now he's got more players up the pitch there with him. He's having to sort of adapt his game a little bit under Garner, I think, to be maybe more of a poacher than a target man. And he's he's definitely snatching his chances a bit more under Garner. He had a fantastic one-on-one chance in injury time to win the game at Tranmere, but dragged it wide. But he's getting in the right positions and he's got tremendous quality. So it's only a matter of time before he goes on another run. Like you say, he's got 
25 goals in 48 games for us since he's come in, which is, I think, more than any of us could have really hoped for yeah. uh, from a free transfer from Coventry on deadline day. Yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's not just Johnson, though, to go back to your question. I think the rest of the team are sort of adjusting to having to contribute before we were very much using him as the focal point. Um, and now we're expecting wingers and central midfielders to get forward and provide a goal threat because it's embarrassing how much of a one-man threat we were before. Uh, Johnson's got 14 goals this season and the next goal scorer down is on three goals. So oh, wow. that sort of says it all, really. Yeah, um, yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah, the... Um, I wouldn't say he's dropped in form. I think he does play very well. He doesn't just score goals. He's mm-hmm. got great hold at play, drags defenders all over the place and creates space for other players. But I do think he's just adapting to a new style and it might just take a month or so before we start to see him back to his best, maybe. The whole team's having to sort of change and, and go with Garner's new style of play. So, yeah, I think yeah. things are just in transition, if you like. Yeah, and I, I, know, I know, again, speaking from experience with Sunderland, that's something that can take time. You know, we, last season and the beginning of this season, were, were so heavily reliant, firstly on Josh Madger to score all our goals, then on Aidan McGeady. And it, it, again, it was something that wasn't really, was spread around in terms of in terms of goal scorers. Um, we seem to have kind of rectified that a little bit now. And the, our top three, I think, top goal scorers are not any of our centre forwards. They're all our wide players. But the, the goals do tend to be shared around that, that little bit more. From your point of view, then, you must have been delighted to see the 31st of January come and go and him still be a Bristol Rovers player. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think Charlton came in with a day or two to go. They offered one million plus Eloni player in, in return um, yeah. I can't remember who the player was I think it was unnamed actually and I think we rejected it so um, we obviously think he's worth more than that I think a lot of mm-hmm. fans are hoping for maybe two million uh, yeah. in today's market which is uh, would be a good return for he's only been here a year so it would be a good good return on investment for us yeah, it's just like he was I a free say, transfer he, he was a free transfer yeah, yeah. Um, Coventry he was fourth choice striker at Coventry and they couldn't get the best out of him so they let him go on a free to us so I think it was a mutual termination of contract and then signed for us with a signing on fee um, so I don't think they've got a sell-on clause um, I could be wrong though but yeah, yeah. He's, he would obviously be massively difficult to replace for us you know, like I said 14 goals and the next player downs on three so it's um, yeah it would have been a, it would have been a shame to lose him so I'm just delighted we've we've kept hold, hold of him really I'm going to say for, for what he can give you it's it's not worth that million pounds is it <laughs> no absolutely he's got still got a year left on his contract so I would say if he gets to 20 before the end of the season then he's likely to go in the summer mm-hmm. but if he doesn't then I can maybe see us offering him a couple grand more pay rise and getting him to sign a new three-year deal with us and hopefully um he can continue to be a goal scorer for years to come but it's a win-win yeah. situation for us, really. I mean, if we get the money for him that we want, then we can build a, a good squad under Garner in his vision. But if we keep him, then we've got a fantastic goal scorer. So. Yeah, yeah. I'd say a lot of Sunderland fans would have liked to have seen him uh, make the trip up north uh, in January. But unfortunately, it wasn't to be. So so just in summary then for you guys, for Bristol Rovers, so you currently sit 19 points from relegation. You're 11 points from the playoffs, but in 13th place, so... 11 points isn't a great deal with a third of the season to go, but obviously there's a lot of teams above you. There could be a case to be made to say that your your season's arguably over. So what are the aspirations for Bristol Rovers fans for the rest of the season? Or indeed, are there even any aspirations for the rest of the season? I agree with what you just said. I think the season's dead for us, really. Um, we're so far off relegation, it, we could lose every game and arguably stay up. It's, mm. You look at, I think it's Tranmere who are the highest in the, in the relegation zone. and Yeah. They're only on, I think, 22 points. Yeah. Uh, so they'd need to, they need to get 19 more points, I think, to catch us without us getting any more points. So yeah. I don't think it's a, it's a concern for us. No. And those um, those teams at the bottom of the league are pretty awful as well. Yes. Yeah. They, 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 they weren't great. I think Southend are one of the worst sides I've seen in some yeah. time. And yeah, 10 points off the playoffs, which we just aren't going to reach because we've not got the quality to, to get there. I don't think. I think that would mm. be a, a massive shock. Um, so, so really, finishing position isn't important. You could finish tenth, or you could finish nineteenth. It wouldn't really make a tuppence of difference, if yeah. I'm honest. What is important is is the performances going from here on. Um, if we can develop our style of play and improve our younger players to build for next season, then that will be a success. Uh, and it seems a bit odd to be saying that in February. Yeah. <laughs> um, February is like there's so many games left to play, but it's such an odd league this year with with relegation pretty much being 
near impossible. So it seems a bit odd to be saying that this early on, but yeah, there was, was 13 games left, or yeah. however many, however many it is. But I, yeah. I guess that's 13 games of preparation that you have for for next season. Yeah, that's um, how you have to look at it as like an extended pre-season almost, yeah, but in a competitive yeah. format. Um, yeah. And he has obviously that's a- that's on on the pretense that you you keep the players that you want and you 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 bring in players that you feel you need to. But it is good, certainly a good platform. Yeah. Um, I think that the task to transform this squad is is going to take time and it's good. We've got this almost three month window to do that now mm. before preseason starts because um, we were built to play one way and one way only. We had no natural wingers in the squad um, other than Alex Rodman, who's been playing at right wing back. Um, all our central midfielders are robust ball winners. We've got one convincing striker, centre backs who play long rather than out from the back. Yeah. Uh, and Ghana definitely wants to do a complete U-turn on that style of play. Um, and that will take time. So, yeah, like I said, it's good that he's got th- those three months of fixtures to do that without any real pressures of going up or down. And uh, so long as the football uh, is entertaining to watch, people will be happy because mm. although results were good under Coughlin, it, it wasn't pretty to watch, if I'm honest. Yeah, it's the it's the age-old dilemma, isn't it, of, of what's your priority? Is it good football or is it winning football matches? Um yeah. Well, exactly. This, this, we've had this debate on, on our podcast. It's, it's been exactly that. Under Coughlin, mm. we had a massive argument over, yeah, results are good, but performances are absolutely dreadful. It's so bad to watch. And when we don't come away with that win, you just feel like you've wasted your entire day. Yeah. Uh, but, but now under Ghana, we're playing some really, really good stuff, but we just weren't getting that win until Saturday. And yeah. a lot of fans were like, well, it's no point. there's no point playing this nice football if you just can't get the result. So mm. it's almost, it's like a case study for us this season. It's very weird. For me, I've always been, whilst we're in League One, said it many times on, on the podcast, that I don't really care how we get out of this league. We just need to get out of this bloody league. You know, I'll, I'll worry about the style of play and, and how well we're playing if, when we get into back into the championship. Um, and some of that might be born out of me being spoiled and having Premier League and championship football not so long ago. But I think the priority for 99% of the Sunderland fans is just get out of this league. And if it means we've got to have 13 more scrappy 1-0 wins from here to the end of the season with terrible football, then you know I think most of us will take that and then worry about the style of play next season when, when we're in the league above, if we're in the league above, obviously. So the looking back then, the, the match at the Memorial Game was postponed earlier this season, which means we're in a bit of a weird situation where we're now into February, into the last third of the season, but still playing each other for the first time in this uh, this campaign, um, which means the last time we played each other was nearly a year ago, which was the Checker Trade semi-final, dare I say. So fast forward a year then, it's, it's a very much a, a new look Sunderland from that Checker Trade semi-final and from the, from the league game. Um, I think five of Sunderland starting 11 from that day have left the club altogether. And it's only really... I think three players. So it would have been the goalkeeper, McLaughlin, uh, Max Power, Luca Nine um, are the only ones really that played a year ago that are, have played any sort of football this season. So it will be a very different Sunderland side. So what have you made of Sunderland's story since that semi-final in the preceding year? And in particular, what do you expect to come up against on Saturday at the Stadium of Light? It's, uh, it's certainly been interesting to watch. Obviously, the, the playoff final uh, against Charlton with that very very late goal yeah um, I was at that and, yeah, I yeah I can't imagine what that's like it, must it be. was horrible <laughs> yeah I mean when you've got like 46 games of build up plus the playoffs it all culminates in that 190 minutes when anything can happen I've yeah. been there myself when Rovers got to Wembley against Grimsby in the National League we went 1-0 down in the first five minutes and I think my sister who got dragged along turned around and said to me it's only a game and I was like you oh, have no idea do you <laughs> that's the worst thing that's the worst thing a non-footballing fan yeah. can say to a football fan yeah yeah, but um, as it happened, went all the way to penalties and we won on penalties, which is so stressful. So I can't imagine what it would have been like to have actually conceded a goal that late. It's yeah, it was the manner. Punch. It was the manner in which we lost that was just so so gutting. Yeah, so it's, it's been very interesting to watch, and I think particularly how Jack Ross will pick up the side to go again this season, and seeing how bad things were going very early on. Um, at one stage, I was thinking to myself, especially when we were quite high up, I was thinking, blimey, we're, we're actually going to finish above Sunderland. That's mm. absolutely mental. Um, <laughs> but evidently, things can change very, very quickly in football. I think one thing that I have noticed, despite your current run of form, like I said, I was doing a bit of a, a bit of research, a bit of prep, is that in spite of you not necessarily scoring goals and not being, uh, not being able to put points on the board, you seem to still be creating quite a lot. 
and getting a lot of shots away. So I was looking at some of the stats and you, you had 19 attempts against Wickham, but only five on target, 15 against Tranmere, only three on target. Is it a case that actually going forward, you're doing the right things, but alluding to what you said earlier, people are snatching at chances or is it just that you've been that unlucky that things are being blocked off the line or cleared off the line or hit the post, etc.? It certainly is a lot of bad luck and snatching at chances at the same time. I think it's a combination of the two. And under Garner, we definitely have seen particularly in January since he's been able to bring in players, uh, particularly wide men, and, and allowed us to play a more expansive uh, style of football, we have seen more chances created and um, more opportunities, uh, goal-scoring opportunities. I think those games under Coughlin would have been very different, probably would have been one or two shots on target, maybe mm-hmm. one or two more goals, because that's just the way <laughs> Coughlin seems to get results. But um, yeah, we do create quite a lot. It's um, it's definitely been an improvement uh, in January. So I would be surprised if we didn't at least provide one or two scares for you guys on, on Saturday, yeah. In spite of our good run of form, because Sunderland fans generally, we, we're a pessimistic bunch. So I think a lot of people are just waiting for the bubble to burst and it wouldn't be a surprise to see a, a team that is in a bad run of form, such as Bristol Rovers, come up and, and, and turn us over. Obviously, we don't want that to happen, but it, w- it wouldn't surprise anybody. But I, I tend to be the eternal optimist in a group of predominantly mm-hmm pessimistic Sunderland fans I think so with with Saturday in mind then are there any players who or any other players that you think we should keep a close eye on or will your chances of success come pretty much down to whether Clark Harris is fit and firing well yeah Johnson is is the obvious danger man he's our top goal scorer 14 goals so far this campaign and um, he'll no doubt be looking to obviously hit that 20 goal landmark if he can Mm. he's got a rocket of a left foot he's obviously got pace and physical prowess as well buys himself space to shoot but his threat will sort of be amplified I think by um, a couple of players we brought in because he's obviously creating more space up front now we've got attacking players out wide there's more opportunities for them to cause problems and I've been really impressed with um, a player we've brought in on loan from Derby County called Jaden Mitchell Lawson Mm -hmm. Um, he's only 20 years old He's never played senior football before, but he's been absolutely fantastic since he's come in. I think he's um, very tricky, presses constantly for 90 minutes, got such good energy, uh, makes things happen when he's on the ball, wants the ball. When he gets the ball, he's aggressive with it. Um, He doesn't just play safe. He wants to make things happen, buys a lot of fouls in dangerous positions. Yeah. Um, And he struck up this really sort of encouraging partnership with Johnson. And I'm sort of hopeful that they can develop that going forwards because um, Mitchell Lawson's been, I think, a really, really smart loan. And I think since we've developed our scouting network this year, uh, we brought in... uh, Tommy Widrington as our chief scout. Mm-hmm. He's identified every player he's brought in, Johnson included, uh, last January has been has been such an underrated signing that it's gone under the radar of so many clubs. When the signing happened, people think, oh, well, he's just a lightweight twenty-year-old who's probably yeah. going to be a bit of depth off the bench. They've obviously watched him play a lot of junior football because he's got something special about him, and it's been a really smart signing. So I think he's definitely one to keep an eye on. Other than Mitchell Lawson, I would probably say um, Josh Barrett if he does come off the bench. I doubt he'll start. Um, we signed him from Reading in January. He's uh, yeah. an attacking midfielder, almost like a shadow striker, but you can also play as like an inside forward on the left. Uh, he doesn't quite look match fit yet, but he's definitely got something about him that's very good technically for this level. So um, I think once he gets some more games under his belt, um, he'll be a big player for us. But off the bench, he's looked a bit of a threat. So he's definitely one to keep an eye on as well. In summary then, uh, you alluded to Anna's change in style since, it, since he's come in. So what can Sunderland fans expect from your Bristol Rovers team at the weekend? What sort of game can we expect? Um, I'm not sure, to be completely honest with you. <laughs> um, given that we're still in transition, I think a lot of play from out wide, getting to the byline and getting crosses in as much as we can to Johnson. High pressing, intensity. I don't think we'll sit back and let you play like we maybe would have under Coughlin. Yeah. Um, but we're still an unknown, and I'm not really sure how we'd approach a big game like this. Um, mm. We've not really had to go away to a big club yet under Garner, so we'll see what kind of setup he goes for. He may even go with two up front and just try and cause a bit of havoc. Um, yeah. We've got Tammy Abraham's younger brother, Timmy, on loan, mm-hmm. um, and he, 
he's <laughs> so much like his brother. He just runs, um, causes just problems, raw pace defenders. and energy. Yeah, makes makes defenders panic. Mm. Um, he runs like a giraffe on ice and just he's all over the place, <laughs> but it just uh, causes problems. Um, so it, I, it I would be, be surprised if we if we maybe just go for two big men up front and. I just don't know. He could he could completely change change it up for this game yeah. because, like I said, we've not had to go away to a tough ground yet. Yeah. Arguably, Wickham was, but we we were the better side there. So yeah, yeah, hard to say. Yeah, yeah the, the the two things that you've said there makes me think that it's going to be quite an interesting game on Saturday because with the one thing you said about getting the ball out wide, getting crosses in. Teams have tried to play that way against us. Oxford tried to do it. Rochdale tried to do it recently, and we've looked so comfortable in, in being able to to deal with that that we've almost backed off wingers at times and let them get the crosses in because we, we, we're so confident that we'll be able to deal with those crosses coming into the box. However, the second bit that, that you said about having a high press and getting in our faces is kind of a little bit been our Achilles heel. So where teams have caused us problems and have gotten at us a little bit, um, irrespective of how, how the result's gone, it has been those teams that have got in our face a little bit and, you know, not giving our centre midfielders any time on the ball, not giving us our, our centre backs any time on the ball. Those have been the teams that have had that little bit of success um, against us. Um, obviously, we're, we're a handful of games down the line now um, and a handful of wins um, and confidence is, is probably a, as high as it's been at the club for, for a very, very long time. But there still seems to be that, that kind of small chink in the armour um, that suggests that, that teams, when they do have a come and have a go at us, we can be susceptible to a, a mistake. So yeah, I think that does make for a very interesting game in prospect on Saturday. So with that in mind then, Max, I'm going to ask you for your prediction for Saturday. And if you want to give me scores, you can give me scores as well. Okay. Um, I think I'll go with 3-1 Sunderland. If I'm honest. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I just look at your recent home form. I think you've, yeah. been, you've had some impressive wins against Wickham 4 0 and Rochdale. Um, mm. I think that was 3 0. So. It was 3 0, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so it's some impressive dominant performances at home. Away from home, we're obviously yet to get a win under Ghana. We are, we're still got some fragilities at the back. Um, you've obviously got some quality attacking players. Uh, Lyndon Gooch is obviously a, a danger man, and I've, he's been a player I've watched with close interest. Yeah. Um, he's, he's definitely one that stood out. And obviously, uh, Chris Maguire as well is always a threat. So mm-hmm. um, I, th- I think maybe those two might get on the score sheet if they play. I don't know how you're going to line up, but they're two players I, I've always seen as danger men for you. So well, I think there's one there's one thing that you can guarantee at the moment in, in, with the Phil Parkinson Sunderland side is that we'll play three five two with wing backs, and it'll probably be the same starting eleven that we've played for the last well, pretty much the same starting eleven for the last eight nine games. Um, one thing that Sunderland fans have realises that Parky's not a tinker man. There probably will be one change because Bailey Wright got injured against Oxford and he's by all accounts out for the season. So there'll be one change at the back and probably Ozturk will will probably come in. But, you know, you can pretty much, as near as damn it, predict what the Sunderland starting 11 will be and what our formation will be because Parkinson's um, used that pretty much throughout his um, his tenure here so far. Okay, yeah, I think I'll stick with three one. I think yeah, uh, I think I think Johnson is going to score um, yeah. an equaliser to make it one one. But then second half, I think you'll push on and get the two goals to win it. Well, I'm, I'm going to. I think for me, I'm going to go two 0 I think just everything, the, the kind of the stars aligned for us at, at, at the right time on Saturday. Um, in that we've, like I said, seven clean sheets in eight games, and with your current scoring problems, and with us being at home and our home record being kind of 4-0 win against Wickham, a 3-0 win against Rochdale, a 1-0 win against Ipswich. Um, Doesn't that I, scream I, to you as going 1-0 down, though? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, like I was I was going to say, it would be, it is a bit of a cliche now, but it would be such a Sunderland thing to do um, for, for us to, you know, go on an amazing run, get our tails up, get our confidence up, fans will be happy, and then for us to go 1-0 down and labour to a, to a draw... Or, or scrape a scrape a win, um, but like I said earlier, I'm I'm kind of the eternal optimist. So I think our defensive record at the moment, in conjunction with your kind of attacking record, I fancy us for another clean sheet. And I'll say two 0 and I think it will be. I'm going to go Lyndon Gooch, and I'm going to go Max Power because he's overdue, kind of a thirty yard screamer because he's not got one uh, for a long while yet, and so he is overdue one. So that's going to be my prediction. So 2-0, Max Power and Lyndon Gooch. 
uh, a positive result um, from my point of view, obviously, my selfish <laughs> yeah, point of, of view. So, Max, we'll, we'll leave it there. Thank you ever so much for joining me this evening. I wish you all the best in your mid-table obscurity. <laughs> Thank um, you very much. Uh, Saturday aside, um, but if you wouldn't mind, you know, doing us a couple of favours a bit later on in the season against some of our promotion rivals, that would be very much appreciated. See what we can do for you. Thanks very much. Lovely. Thanks again, Max. Lots Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Well, could you tell who it was? Uh, who was who? Uh, I'm not sure I could, but um, it's going to be a memorable one for, for me and my family on Saturday. Uh, my lad Thomas will be mascot, and I think my mum, my wife, and my uh, eldest son are going to be there as well. None of whom are great football fans, but they'll be in the crowd cheering, cheering the lads along. And there's a few branch meetups on Saturday as well. Mike, uh, the Irish Black Cats are getting together. Yeah, so we're meeting up in um, Dublin City Centre. Johnny Rush's uh, will be showing the match there. It's just it's it's literally uh, just off Grafton Street, which is the main street in Dublin City. And we're expecting a big crew over from Sunderland for the match. There's lads coming over for the Calpacino Bellator fight, but it's been cancelled. And we're expecting himself and all his uh, entourage to be joining us for the game on Saturday. So we're looking so forward to that. So we'll probably be there for about half two if um, anyone is in Dublin for the weekend. That sounds like a, a great afternoon and evening out in Dublin. Sure, um, it'd be a long night. I think, is the, is the rugby on as well this weekend? That's Again, Sunday, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure I'll make it a double header. Um, we've also had <laughs> um, a, a notification from our friends at uh, NASA, the North American Sports Association, that they're going to be meeting up in Toronto. And that is at the Craft Brasserie and Grill on Atlantic Avenue in Toronto. Um, they've also got meetups in Charlotte, North Carolina at the um, the Courtyard Hooligans Pub and in San Diego at the Shakespeare Pub. Thames Valley Mackens have also let us know that they've got a group of fans going to the Coventry match in Birmingham on March the 1st. Uh, I might see them there and they'd like to invite any fans in the Thames Valley area to join them on their trip up the M40 that day. Also, the Branch Liaison Committee have asked me to mention their fantastic mental health drop-in with Washington Mind, which will be at the Beacon of Light again this Saturday from 11.45 to 2.45, so just before kickoff, um, pop along there. You can have a cup of tea and a chat. If you want to speak to a counsellor, you can just have a natter with the the people who are running it. It's a fantastic initiative and uh, we should all be supporting one another's mental health. Uh, It's something that, you know, is really important to me and a lot lot of the Exiles lads and a lot of lads from Rope Report as well. So um, do we have any score predictions for Bristol Rovers then, fellas? 2-0. I'm expecting, yeah, I'm expecting another pretty comfortable home win. I don't think Rovers are anything special, even when they were in good form. They were never really a team I was sweating as a team that might be challenging for promotion. Clark Harris is a very good player at this level, but he's yet to score against us in four meetings. So I think it should be a comfortable one for us. I agree. It's one of those games that we just have to turn up, do the business and and move on to to the Fleetwood game in which we, we have to do the same. I think it's a similar game to the, the Rochdale game that we had recently and potentially the Lincoln game. And really, we need to put on a half-decent performance, get a couple of goals and and get three points. Um, listening to Max and Bomber, they're obviously Bristol Rovers have, have been in a bad run of form, although they got a, a win against Blackpool there, which saw the end of Simon Grayson. And we uh, we just need to, to get the three points, as simple as that. Mike? Yeah, yeah I'd echo that as well. I, I think it'd be... If we get an early goal, hopefully it'll be similar to the Rochdale and Lincoln and Wickham games, maybe win 2-3-0. Um, as the lads were saying there, Bristol Rovers uh, on bad bad run of form, only got their first win there uh, since Graham, I think since their new manager, Ben Garner, came in. So I think if we get the early goal, we should win comfortably. I'll, I'll go with a 3-0 win. I think law of averages says we're probably going to concede in this game, but I do think we're going to get uh, two or three goals. So I'm going to go with 2-1. I think they might even shock us with a with a with a quick goal early on, and then we'll we'll battle our way back into it. But I am ever the pessimist. Um, so let's move on. Let's 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 play a game of playing away. Um, I'll just get it up on my screen here. We've gone for a game this week uh, from the twenty second of February two thousand and three. It was it was a defeat for Sunderland, a home defeat. Sunderland won Middlesbrough three. 
in front of 42,134 at the Stadium of Light. We had Howard Wilkinson in charge of this match. Um, it was a Premier League match. Um, so uh, just to run through the newly tweaked rules really quickly, each um, player takes turns to name a, a, a player in the game. There's a 15-second limit that, unlike Brett, I will enforce with a duck noise. If I can get that duck noise up on my phone and put it to 15 seconds. Um, you get two lives each. If you name a sub, you don't lose a life anymore, but uh, you don't lose a life, but you don't get a, a, another go anymore. Last man standing gets two points. And if more than one player uh, is still in after the last footballer is named, everyone gets a point. And I've been giving games a difficulty rating. And like I said earlier, I think this is, is pretty high on that difficulty scale. I give it a 9 out of 10. And thanks in advance to the statcat.co.uk for the squad listings as ever. So the, I've randomly chosen the order that you're going in. And uh, I think we're going to probably do distance away from me here. So we're going to go with uh, Martin first and then Jimmy, probably just about even with Mike, really. But we'll go Martin, Jimmy, then Mike. So we are in 2003 in February. Martin, uh, do you want to go for an easy hit? Or are you going to gamble for a, for a more difficult player? Howard Wilkinson, eh? That was a, a torturous time to be turning up every week and watching, watching his team. There was some flying geese in, in Howard Wilkinson's lineup, I think. But Kevin Kilban is the player I'm going to give you. Kevin Kilban, great. Yep, he was. He was on the wing. Absolutely. All right, so Jimmy, we're coming to you. I'll start my timer. I am nervous about this one. I am going to try. Risky one to start. I'm hoping Tommy Sorensen was the goalkeeper. He was He was the goalkeeper. That's very, yeah. very good. Um, so you've got that one. Mike, your turn. Sorry, Martin, Rob, one of mine there. I always go for the Irish lads. Um, Five, four, uh, go. three. McAteer. McAteer, absolutely fantastic. Good call. <laughs> yeah, he was in there. All right, so um, back to you, Martin. I'll start the timer now. I'm going to go for what I hope is a relatively safe one, Kevin Phillips. Kevin Phillips, yes, he was in the squad. He was up front in that game. Absolutely. Jimmy. Right, we're gonna we're gonna go a bit more risky because there could be anyone that he's playing up front with, but I'll I'll gamble that it was Flo. Oh, good call. Absolutely. Yeah, the tour Andre Flo was up front. So I think we've gone through a lot of the uh, the 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 obvious ones. There's one or two more who, who could be rolled off the tongue. Mike, it's your go. Um thinking of defenders back then. Uh, I think we just signed Stephen Rice around that time. Stephen Wright, yes, that's a very good call. I was down in London at this time and I wasn't going to watch us regularly. Uh, so it, probably this why well, it looked a, a bit more difficult from, from my end. All right, back with you, Martin. I'm going to go for another one, which I hope is a, a safe one, but maybe isn't. Um, Michael Gray. Michael Gray, absolutely. We have we are getting close to the difficult ones, I have to say. So um, we're with you now again, Jimmy. Right. Gavin McCann. Gavin McCann. This is a flawless performance, I have to say, lads. Flawless performance so far. Mike, the pressure is back on you now. Oh. The options are being reduced. Okay. So I'm thinking again, going with the defenders. Mm, um, I said him before, Jody Craddock. Jody Craddock. Excellent. Yes. All right. So I think we've only got we've got two players left. So Mike, you've got, I think you've got away with this unless. We have some errors. Martin. Right. We're getting down to the nitty gritty now. Um, I'm going to throw in Michael Proctor. No, he was on the bench. I want to get so the final midfield. Yeah, I'm, I'm torn between two. I'm get, Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go for Matty Piper, left field. No, as another sub. Another sub. Possibly this is why we lost the game. The fact that those two were on the bench rather than on the pitch. Um, Mike, we are with you. So okay. we've uh, got Piper and Proctor subs already yeah. named. Proctor get a chance. Um, surely Julio was playing Julio Arca. He wasn't. He was on the bench as well. See that this is why we didn't win that game. Clearly, ridiculous squad selection. So Martin didn't think we'd get back to you, but we've still got two to name. 
I've just had a, a, a recollection of, of that game, and this might be might be the wrong game. I might sound completely mental, but I think three on the right midfield two, was Marcus Stewart. One, no, it wasn't. Martin has a. Oh, I'm gonna have to stop that duck timer. So it wasn't so Martin. You've lost a life. Okay, so Stuart not on the bench. No. Stuart wasn't even on the bench. No, so you lost a life there. Not in the squad. Jimmy, we're with you. There are two left to name. Yeah, another try for the midfielder um, because his son was on TV last night. I'm going to go for Claudio Reyna. Claudio Reyna, no, you've lost a life. I knew these two would stump you, but you all, Mike, it's your goal. Oh, I, I, I'm struggling here to think of any names. Um, no, I can't. <laughs> Mine's blank. You're going to pass? Bjor- Bjorkland. I said him last Bjorkland. Week. No, sure. Bjorkland wasn't there. No. Nope. Oh. So you've all lost a life in this round. We're back with you, Martin. Can we run through the side, Rich? What, who we have. We have. This is thinking time for you all. Um, we have Sorensen in goal. Um, we've got Stephen Wright, Michael Gray, Jason McAteer, Jordy Craddock, Gavin McCann, Kevin Phillips, who was the goal scorer. I'll give you that clue. Uh, Tor Andre Flo, Kevin Kilban. And on the bench, you have named Arca, Piper and Proctor. So... All right, so we've got your time now. Centre half in the midfield. I'm I'm going to have a stab at the other centre half, and it might be my um, last life gone. I'm going to go for the the legend that is Phil Bab. Phil Bab was on the bench. You don't lose a life, but you don't get the point. He was on the bench. We have run out of outfield um, subs though, so uh, Jimmy, you don't have that fallback now. Still, these two outstanding players, although probably not outstanding, given the fact that nobody can guess their names. We'll we'll go with Thornton. Thornton, no. Jimmy, you're out, mate. Nightmare. That's it. You're gone. Mike, you're hanging in there on one life. You couldn't... <laughs> hanging in with, with no names in my head. Um, we'll start your time. I've, I've literally thinking of anyone back then. Um, we had this chap... Uh, Lillian Las Landes, or whatever you pronounce him, Peter Reedbottom, French he did. striker. He did, but he's not in the side. Uh-oh. Mike is out. Martin, you've survived because we've been around, and I think you've won the game because we're on the same round of uh, of choices. Do you wanna do you wanna have a stab at our two outstanding players? Oh, I'll. I feel I feel like um, Sunderland winning the League Cup in 2014. Um, Stephen Schwartz. Stefan Schwartz, no, it wasn't there. But you're right, you're out. That's your last life, and I'm going to give you them, or we'll be here all night. That was tough. At, at the back, we had Tom? Talal El Kukuri. Oh, oh my oh, oh, oh. <laughs> And on the wing, I think I assume he was on the wing, was David Bellion. Oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. David Bellion. I, I, w- so, I wouldn't have got them if I was there all night, to be fair. That yeah, was no, why. Really, that was why it was nine out of ten because all the obvious players were on the bench. So that um, was um, Howard Wilkinson very, very, trying anything he could get a win <laughs> to get a win, wasn't it? Yeah. That was, it was a, a terrible, terrible performance. I remember. El listen, I remember listening to it. El Kukuri. He was on loan, wasn't he? For David Bellion. Yeah. Well, I didn't think you were going to get those, and that's why I give it a nine out of ten. Well done. I, th- I think it's just. I think you won that, Martin, because you got through more rounds than than the others. Um, but uh, unlucky, fellas, for for not completing that. Um, and a, an, another win for Martin. Nobody's yet compiled the table. Uh, somebody might uh, have a have a week off work to listen back to all our pods this year, and add the points up. So. Um, Cheers for your time this evening, lads. It's been lovely to talk to you. And uh, thanks to everyone for listening, whether that's on your commute in the bath or on your way to the match. Um, and don't forget to like and subscribe to the Roker Report on your podcatcher of choice. Leave us a five-star review. And finally, I want to say uh, RIP, rest in peace to Andy Weatherall, the swordsman. Changed music forever for me. He'll always be my heart, man. And goodbye, sub. Cheers, lads. Speeches later. Cheers, now. See you later. Cheers. Cheers. Sarah.